Why would you do such a thing? Well, because I don't expect it from her. Oh, true. Yeah. Well, the disclaimer is just pff, whatever. By the way, sorry. <laughs> We're deleting that part, anyways. <laughs> Jeez, dude. Well, you see, the the guy, the white belt, he decided to tell me. He's like, I'm looking out for those wrist locks now, and I took that personally. Mm. Like looking out for them. Like he's trying not to get caught in them. Oh, well, don't leave a limp wrist. You'll be all right. That's what I showed him. Yeah. And he left a limp wrist out there. It's going to get caught. Yeah. He was hitchhiking. Mm-hmm. Mm. And I said, whack them all. <laughs> <laughs> Got him. But the indubitable boots tried to call me out for being a butt. Mm. Wrist lock and a knee bar and a white belt. Yeah. He's just soft. Well, nah, much love to Boots. He's going through some things right now. Yeah, but that's more of like, you know, like a lot of, you know, uh, females around 12 years old go through that, and he's just doing it at 37. But no, that's not what she means, no. Bill. That's not what I mean, Bill. <laughs> oh. Oh. Uh, oh, you're okay. being serious. I was, yeah. <laughs> you're a horrible person. Well, I love you, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, episode, what, 80? <laughs> All right. So, uh, anyway, uh, welcome back, Dr. Carrie Hardy. Hey. Uh, now, three-stripe brown belt. <gasps> oh, putting hey. it on blast. Isn't that a HIPAA violation? No, no. it is not. Because it's out in the public? It's and, out in the public. And we're married. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Kind of goes with it. Yeah. yeah. Put it out there. You got any nerves about black belt? Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. What is it? Like what what is it the weight of it? All of it. You know, it's it's like what you guys talked about when you got yours, right? Mm -hmm. That like oh shit, that's going to be coming up. Like it's actually like in sight. Yeah. Well, I hope like he waits a few more years. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> yeah. Cuz you do you know as like I always felt like I didn't know anywhere near as much as I thought I would. Oh yeah. Then you're like Yeah. I'm like, I got to step some things up. Yeah. I actually got to, like, think about it and drill and mm. maybe go in with a plan these days. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so. It's brutal. Yeah. Because I get comfortable. I like half guard. Yeah. I like attacking people from my half guard. Kind of like this. That It's almost like, it's not lazy jujitsu, but it's like comfortable jujitsu. Okay, now, let's be honest. She attacks people when they have her back. Mm. Oh, yeah. She will has that nasty little poor, ankle lock. Poor little Drew. He wasn't happy with that yesterday. Like, uh -oh. He crossed his ankles? No. He just gave me a foot, so I... Oh. Oh, you're talking about your little... Foot locked him. That was the thing I was laughing at you about. Yeah. Because she tried it on me. I couldn't get it. Couldn't. It, he's too flexible. I said, this works on old man River. <laughs> it does. It does. <laughs> Not on old Gumby, though. Yeah. Mm-mm. I, I'm sure it could actually. It just it would have to be like a, a very specific. Like you'd have to have like a really good position or something. Like you know what I mean? Yeah. I'd have to be like higher up. For or, you, it was really like trying to get you to move a little bit. Yeah. 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 And I moved. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. She gets you to respond to it, and then she takes advantage of it. Right? Yeah. Even if you don't get, she doesn't submit you with it. The turn carries up a little bit. Hi. Her mic. Sorry. This mic is very sensitive to uh, if you're up on it. It like really sounds good but if you're a little bit of ways then we have to boost it up i feel like oh. i'm a child that's why we, we turn it up so you don't have okay. to get up on that thing like it's chris <laughs> it is sunday night Ew. look at you look at him glowing <laughs> duh well that was from saturday night oh gosh oh here we go old hunting down the <laughs> misconnections on craigslist huh <laughs> i get it it's, it's entertaining Especially when you call and they answer. Yeah, so let's get to the first question. <laughs> How about that? And so, then Car actually, and Carrie's here to talk about peptides too mm. for recovery and some you know pretty cool stuff. So yeah, we did have some questions come in previously about muscle growth, muscle recovery. Yeah, and it kind of falls right in line with the is it peptide therapy? I mean, what would you call mm -hmm. it? Or peptide supplements? And Pe peptide therapy because they okay. really should be prescribed but we'll get more into that once you okay they're technically thera out. peptide therapeutics so thus mm -hmm. yeah okay yeah. hang out that first question so yeah we we did have a question come <laughs> in <Finger> <laughs> easy <laughs> dang it carrie 
So we did have a question come in, and it was about BCAAs, mm -hmm. creatine, semiglutide, not semiglutide. What was it? Uh, glutamine? Glutamine, mm -hmm. sorry. I got Wago V on the brain. Oh, my god! Is that the right word? That is. Look at you, Bill. I know. Look at the big brain on Bill. I know. So um, when do you take these? Is there an optimal time to take them? Pre-workout, post-workout, right before bed, in the morning while you're taking a deuce? When do you do it? Yeah, so let's break it, break them apart first a little bit. BCAAs, mm -hmm. branched chain amino acids. Um, I think both pre-workout and may, and post. Oh, yep. As in, you wouldn't take it twice. Yeah, you can. Oh, okay. you can. You don't. You don't have to do big doses each time. But you know, kind of getting your body into the anabolic state, hitting the anabolic. You know, the mTOR switch. Uh -huh. um, BCAs one through of, your workout. Through the workout and then leucine, especially from the branched chain amino acids, hits the mTOR pretty hard for to flip the switch anabolic for muscle building. Um, I mean, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of research back and forth on what's the optimum time. I just think it, it just makes logical sense to me to certainly afterwards. Mm. I th I would do them post workout with a BCA. Mm -hmm. Okay. It depends on what you're using them for too. Like sometimes during, um, like if I have a reduced calorie intake day, not a full fast, but yeah. let's say I'm trying to cut weight a little bit for whatever reason. Yeah. Um, I'll actually get um, a whole uh, thing of water that I usually drink during the day anyway and put a scoop of BCAAs in there and just kind of drink it throughout the day mm -hmm. during uh, those kind of reduced calorie days where I'm not really like I'm, I'm not eating lunch or something like that. Got it. It's not a meal replacement by any stretch, but I'm just, you know, timing a, a specific yeah. way. But I would, if you're going to any of them out of those listed, um, you know, I think the BCAAs are the most, um, the timing could potentially make some difference anyway. Okay. Creatine well, with them. They have most important, out of these three, out of those three, that's you the listed. one that if you're gonna be sensitive to the timing of taking it, it's yeah. probably the most beneficial. To if me, there is. Yeah. yeah, there is. I would take it, but certainly post workout, I think, is a really good time to do it. Um, now, I'm gonna I'm gonna pass the glutamine to carry, um, but the uh, creatine, typically, if it's you have it in your system, it's kind of loaded. Mm. You know, you, I take it in the morning. <clears throat> Um, again, there's other benefits to creatine besides, um, performance. There's, they're doing a lot of work now on, uh, uh cognition in neurodegenerative diseases. Mm -hmm. Um, it seems to have a pretty good benefit just to take as a supplement, especially as you age too. Wait, that's the one that they did some studies with like, uh, senior home people, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And it's like had really good results Yeah, with just giving them. That's right. Everything yeah. else stayed the same. So, well, yeah. And it, it makes sense, right? Because as we get older, appetite starts to decrease. Perhaps they're not eating as much protein as perhaps they should, where they would be getting more of the creatine mm -hmm. from. So it, it makes a lot of sense that it would help with neuro recovery for them. Yeah. yeah. But that's not so much of a timing thing. Whenever you want, I typically do my creatine in the morning. I don't think it it doesn't matter as much certainly not like a beta alanine or one of those performance enhancers like uh, that okay. that you take like before yeah. right um and what do you think about glutamine so yeah, as you know i recommend glutamine a lot for uh people that are having digestive issues because right. it's really important for gut healing especially mm. the stomach right mm -hmm. when we have those um the ulcers right it's a primary fuel so I don't think necessarily, for me, I don't think of it as timing for exercise. Mm -hmm. Just um, I recommend it once a day for patients right before their heaviest meal uh, for stomach health overall. Okay. Um, but Dr. Seeds, uh, interesting, he's uh, the founder of the Seed Scientific uh, Research and Performance Center. Um, he's also the person that I do... 99% of my peptides studying under. Mm. Um, <clears throat> he is actually recommending like amino acids throughout the day with like electrolyte water. That's kind of what I was talking about. For better hydration, period. That's interesting. And then it, stepping that up after exercise. Mm. So, Like I was saying about kind of putting some amino acids in your yeah. regular, mm -hmm. yeah, interesting. Into okay. your electrolyte water. Yeah, yeah very yeah. cool. 
Yeah. Mm. What's the difference between BCAAs and EAAs? Okay. Because e- EAAs seems to be like the newer like thing that now, people try to Essential add. amino acids, basically ones you can't create yourself that you have to get from the diet. It's very much like essential fatty acids. It's the same type of thing where you, your body can manufacture and convert a ton of amino acids, right? Mm-hmm. There's some of them that it really can't make, um, and those are called essential. Okay. Mm. Branch chain amino acids are a specific type of amino acid where the what we call the R group, you don't need to know the chemistry, but basically, the t- I think I've talked about this before, probably bored a bunch of people, but you have a, a general amino amino acid structure, kind of its foundation, and what makes them different is these little tails called R groups, okay? And if the R group has a branching structure, they're called branch chain amino acids. It just, it turns out that those, especially leucine, are very anabolic. In other words, they, they hit the mTOR pathway. Essential amino acids, um, where some of the branch chain are essential, but not all essential, essential amino acids are branch chain. Mm-hmm. Does mm-hmm. that make sense? Mm-hmm. Will I look like you if I take them? I, yeah. You think really? so? Oh, yeah. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Just like that? <laughs> Just like that. Okay. I will never take them. <laughs> I was waiting on. I was like, I was waiting. I'm like, this could go one or two ways. It's a setup, Carrie. Can he stay complimentary or? Nope. Oh no, we knew that wasn't going to happen. Mm. Yeah. So the other thing about leucine, um, and we, d- I don't know that we brought this up when we talked about the semaglutide during um, one of the podcasts. Uh, there is some research that's showing that low doses of that about one to 1.5 grams per day, a couple or twice a day, um, each. So 1.1 to 1.5 grams twice daily can also help support weight loss. Mm, Okay. Yeah. Chris, weren't you doing a supplementing with leucine? Uh, Just branch chain. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. Interesting. Yep. Okay. I need every little bit I can. Yeah, we know. (laughs) Um, You're such a butt. (laughs) I'm, I'm an honest friend. He's just jealous. That's all so true. I do. Yeah. He's hoping. He's but hoping. That's okay. For a he chest like that? Is that what you're saying? You should. I, I do. I mean, that's a stage I need to get to. Yeah. I'm struggling. Struggling my whole life. Actually, we know another guy that's been struggling for three years to grow his chest. <laughs> I'm letting you go he's down. Al- he's also the one that had the finger incident. He did. Yeah. I'm letting you all go down in flames. I'm not going to get him. <laughs> he brought it up this today. One. Okay. He brought it up today. He's been trying to grow his chest because I told him what the subject was today. Mm. Muscle growth and mm-hmm. recovery. Mm-hmm. And he's like, well, damn it. I've been trying to grow my chest for three years. Mm. Why hasn't he been able to grow his chest? Bad genetics. No, <laughs> I doubt it. That's a low blow. <laughs> I don't think that's the truth. I, uh, you know, you, you look at someone that is a, an athlete that is over 40 now. Man, he is going to love that you called him an athlete. <laughs> he is. I'm just saying. But he is. You know, I mean, there might it might be time to, you know, maybe replace some things that may be lost. Bomba? Not bomba, mm-hmm. but, you know, like look at a TRT thing. Mm. Do you know what kind of workouts he does for the chest? I have no idea. Mm. But I don't work out that way. Mm-hmm. So that just throws it all. As in the- for like a visual aesthetic and like... Yeah, I'm def I'm definitely not the guy to ask. I I'm not from the bodybuilder kind of Mm -hmm. pedigree because he just wants to set a cha chas on him. (laughs) Well, he he can do pec implants. There we go. No, no, please. You provide those. (laughs) It won't be pretty, but (laughs) no, no, that's not my scope of practice. (laughs) You? He could go to Mexico and get them. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm not a plastic surgeon. I'm not going to do any of that. Yeah, they would they would look at him down there and they'd sell them. Probably. Old Ginge. Got a soft mouth. Yeah, they would think he's related to Canel or something. All right. You okay? You getting yeah, I'm fine. Right? I'm just waiting for, yeah, this is going to be funny when this one comes up. He's so uncomfortable. No, I think it's funny. I don't know. He's squirming you, right now. Usually it's you. I know. Yeah. But it's just, it's, he's kind of. I'm funny. just waiting for your demise here. I'm, it's going to happen. He wants to know how to grow his chest. I'm just trying to be a friend. Well, so let's get into it then. Okay. Peptides. Peptides, muscle growth, and muscle recovery. Thought, okay, yeah. is that the only question we had? That's it. Yeah, I thought we had one about the exercise. 
Oh, yeah. Oh, the knees? Jeez. <laughs> yes. So there is a question on YouTube. You posted a beautiful workout video um, that I believe was the one with the rings, mm -hmm. and you're putting your feet in, or your heels, and then uh, maybe you can kind of explain what the workout is, what it's working. Yeah, it's the one we put um, up there to, to talk about you know, working your hamstrings, but with a little instability, you know, mm -hmm. putting your feet in the rings and, you know, kind of, kind of doing elevating to a plank yeah. and then kind of curling in. Yeah, it's, pre it's pretty hard. Yeah, and some people have commented and said it's a really good workout. Um, now, there was a question, though. Knee positioning. Yep. Knees are tight and close together. Knees are maybe externally rotating the hips so they're mm -hmm. wide. Mm -hmm. How it, what, what's that supposed to look like? So knees together would give you some artificial, give you a little more stability. Mm. And it may... Which is not necessarily what we want. No, it's not really realistic either, what we want. True. You know, um, typically when we're clamping, doing like a, you know, from guard, like with a triangle or, a, mm -hmm. you know, like we talked about, an arm bar or any of those type of positions, um, we don't have our, both our knees together. We mm -hmm. typically don't anyway, especially playing guard. It's usually a no-no. Right. You get kind of smashed. Mm -hmm. um, but it when you put them put those limbs together, it gives you a little more stability, and we we want a little less stability. Mm. As far as you, we want you to have to generate your own independent of, like, you know, kind of splinting your legs together, mm -hmm. right? So if you have them out separately, each one of those legs is having to kind of control its position as you do the curl. But we're not going to be like a butterfly stretch where no. are going outward. No. But maybe just inside like a, shoulder. Like a squat. Okay. Squat position or maybe even a little narrower. Maybe shoulder width is right. fine too. Right. Yeah. And then just using that kind of like as a track yeah. as much as you can. What's interesting is you can actually do a single leg version of that where you can have one leg just remain straight. And you can just curl one in. That sounds very hard. Yeah, it's definitely hard. So, so effectively, you're planking. You're planking with one, and, and then, then you're curling, and in. then you're curling. You're basically then curling your whole body in with one leg. Yeah. So you can really advance that as you get stronger with it. Not gonna do it. Mm. Yeah. What if it made your chest bigger? I'd think about it. <laughs> I'd at I, least think about it. I feel like you could do that, Bill. Though your hamstrings are pretty big. Yeah, but they might but not be big, strong. big and strong, though. Yeah, yeah. I'm not strong. All, all show. Yeah. No go. I'm not strong when it comes to weights. The guy you're talking about that's trying to grow his chest mm -hmm. is really strong with weights. Just in general. Mm. That's is, my point. Is he strong with weights? <laughs> yeah, I think he's strong in general. Whatever. I mean, he could. I've seen him train up to and make really good gains with like powerlifting too. Mm -hmm. Um, that hypertrophy type of thing is a whole, there is some certainly genetics involved with that. Mm. Um, if you are having a trouble building muscle mass where you previously could, mm -hmm. then we start looking at hormonal type of things. Maybe you're trying to drop mm. an off at that point. Yeah. So you'd have to really look at like, okay, are what's you your history? hypertrophy style? Workout, yeah, like totally. A bodybuilder. Yeah. Or, or, and then if you are, and it's been years nutrition sleep hormones we got to start looking at these other things and plus the leaner you are the more i mean perfect example of this if you go back and look at the movie 300 mm -hmm. those guys weren't big and huge and muscular mm -hmm. for the most part right they got super lean the mm -hmm. guy that trained them his name is mark twite he was a uh, kind of big back in the cr when the crossfit was in its heyday and it's you know there he was mm -hmm. like almost like a, a competition type of thing but he had a pretty elite list of clients as a trainer and he was hired for the 300 movie and his whole point was look i just need to make these guys super lean right and they look bigger yeah right get them to 10 percent body fat and or blow like, and they look jacked you know yeah. even if they're not muscular even the muscles themselves aren't huge. yeah he doesn't have to worry about putting another 15 pounds of muscle exactly on them. it's just let's cut some of the fat the, le the leanness right build a little muscle and, yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. so i think aesthetically that'd probably be so did you just call him that no you called him not you? not lean. I think that's what I heard. The opposite of lean. <laughs> you guys both suck. <clears throat> Just so you I'm know. Saying your hero is going to kill you. <laughs> he's, my, he's my mentor. You guys should show better respect. <laughs> he doesn't okay. even listen. There's okay. re there's respect on the mats. Yeah. Yeah. Where it belongs. Well, we'll we'll then segue when we're talking. Now we're talking about muscle building mm -hmm. and recovery. But that's that's actually a great little segue. 
right? right. So when we're thinking about building muscle, recovering, et cetera, when does sarcopenia actually start? What the After reproduction. Sarcopenia is loss of muscle mass. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, it's part of what's what we call frailty. Mm -hmm. When when you've seen old people and they get they just lose their muscle mass and they can barely get around. Sure. I mean that's like a big reason that they fall easily, right? Is yeah. Well, Osti, you've heard of the fall is detrimental for them. Okay. Because they can't recover. And they have um, usually osteopenia or osteoporosis mm -hmm. as well too. Um, but sarcopenia specifically means loss of muscle mass, mm -hmm. and um, it, it yeah, it's, yeah it starts it becomes we more noticeable in the fourth decade of life. Yep. Yeah. So forty. <laughs> Look at you, Bill. You can do math. Yeah, That's, I just got there. Yeah, um, and so because we start losing what's called satellite muscle satellite cells. They are the muscles version of stem cells that don't allow for more muscle growth and more repair, which is also another reason why we tend to like get injured more readily when we start getting older. Um, if we're not doing the things that we need to do, and there are things that we've talked about in previous podcasts about how to stay healthy and you know, staying healthy on the mats, include all of those foundational things and we'll still go through a few of those but um just genetically we start losing some of those if we're not doing what we can to train them up and keep those healthy many people will start to turn towards things like the anabolic steroids more of the ones that we think about for the mm. those people that are juicing and not those that are doing testosterone responsibly mm -hmm. but those are problematic because they lead to a whole host of other health issues that then we have to compensate for. Things like cardiovascular disease, um, uh, a loss of uh, testicular volume. Mm -hmm. That still happens with testosterone itself, but that's because you're replacing what's being lost, so that little factory can shut down. But when we have the anabolic steroids, which are much more um, aggressive, mm -hmm tends to have more of a negative effect on them. Mm. Um, can have gynecomastia, so guys developing breasts. Um, infertility comes with those as well. So mm -hmm. we need to be super careful about what we're putting in to try to help um, people build muscle and maintain uh, healthy muscle. So that's not always healthy muscle, right, Chris? Yep. Okay. Mm. Um, so um, <clears throat> things that Peptides are great. I love peptides. It's one of my favorite subjects. It's mm -hmm. something I love to prescribe for people. Um, and they should be prescribed, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few moments. Um, but we don't want to forget any of those foundational pieces when we're talking about recovery and building muscle. So sleep, which whole podcast on. Nutrition, which we've had a whole podcast on. Mm -hmm. Especially things that have good sources of protein. So not too... Um, uh, offend anybody who's vegetarian or vegan, mm -hmm. but you are missing some things when you're not having red meat specifically. So you better make sure you have something like the branch chain amino acids as mm -hmm. a drink um, and a good multivitamin as well, because you're going to be lacking there. Well, and those um, plant sources are not as bioavailable either. What does that mean? In other words, you can eat something two things that have 20 grams of protein, okay? One from an animal source, one from plant sources. Mm -hmm. The amount of protein you're actually going to extract in your body and use is much higher with the animal source. And that's non-debatable. Okay. I mean, it's been, this is, I don't care what ideology you have or whatever, it doesn't matter. Animal sources are much more bio, they're available for use much better. So that's when you say, oh, well, this thing, this is a, you know, plant-based protein. You know, people will argue on, they'll say, no, you can use hemp and blood. That's fine. There are some plant-based proteins that are better than others, but they all pale in comparison to bioavailability for animal-based protein. That's just the reality of it. And what Carrie's saying is, if you are, let's say you are a vegetarian for ethical reasons, mm -hmm. completely respect that. Right, I'm yep, not going to yeah. tell you you're a bad person. No, sure. I mean I completely understand yeah, factory that. Factory farming sucks. Absolutely, yeah. it does. That's a whole other discussion. But um, there's some holes in your nutritional game with that, mm -hmm. and don't think that there's not. 
Um, so it's really important. Um, like Carrie said, you may need to do, especially like long chain um, omega threes, some essential fatty acids you're not getting. Um, B12, which is almost exclusively an animal protein. Um, bioavailable. Bioavailable. There. Yeah, absolutely. So um, it's if you are a vegetarian, you may need to look at, like Carrie said, maybe doing some branched chain amino acids mm -hmm. or something. And, and a good multivitamin. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, other things that help us maintain muscle mass and, and uh, help with repair uh, besides sleep, we've already talked a little bit about hormone optimization, and we've done two separate podcasts on that. Yeah. Um, appropriate caloric intake. Uh, so uh, especially if you're one of those individuals where you're working on, on cutting weight, um, if you were heavy into competition and cutting weight, like you got to make sure that especially after you're done uh, with your competition, you're putting the appropriate calories back in because mm. you're not going to heal from that, right? We sustain injuries along the way sometimes that aren't necessarily enough to, to knock us out of the competition. Um, and, and then if, depending how driven you are, you decide to go ahead and compete, like you still need to make sure that you're refueling yourself appropriately so you can heal afterwards. Um, optimizing mitochondrial function, which we haven't talked about on this podcast, and that could be a whole separate podcast itself. Most people think that, oh, I'll just do an NAD supplement. Well, there's been studies done on those NAD supplements that are commercially available, and a lot of them don't even have in there what they say they have in there. Um, mm. And I heard a very interesting um, talk last weekend when I was attending a conference um, about NAD, and maybe that's really not even what we should be doing. We should be looking at something else to help with the balance of NAD that we can make. What is NAD? NAD is a nicotinic... Um, you don't need it. Yeah. Nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. There we go. <laughs> they, thank you. Do not blame you for not remembering that. Yeah. Uh, I should know it. I should know what it. What is it? Something. Nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. I mean, we're just making up words at this point. <laughs> no, we're not. It's an important currency factor that's made if our mitochondria okay. are working appropriately and is used during that mitochondrial process. Yeah, especially electron transport and the, mm -hmm. like, uh, basically the production of energy. The mitochondria, just to back up, are the energy production parts of the cell. Okay. Your cell has this, these factories, quote unquote the mitochondria and they are the ones that process nutrients to make energy from them in the form of ATP. NAD is kind of a little messenger that helps pass electrons along this thing called electron tra transport chain that makes all that possible. Okay. And so when you start to have problems in your mitochondria, um, that factory starts breaking down. That's one of the kind of the hallmarks of the aging process and accelerated aging too. That's mm -hmm. why diabetics, age so quickly they have very bad mitochondrial dysfunctions yeah that was full nerd alert right there i know that was intense <laughs> but i'm here but it's important right because yeah. you know everybody's in this biohacking sphere and, and right. peptides are certainly a, a portion of that um and they're you know the the big thing like even six years ago was NAD and NAD IVs and i've heard of then it it's a not lot NAD, yeah. then we need to actually do nmn and the the lecture that i actually heard made a really great argument for why we shouldn't be doing that. So really quick, all these things, the idea behind this is as you age, we have shown that um, as mitochondrial function decreases, you start to lose the amount of NAD mm -hmm. in your cell. So the idea was, oh, let's just supplement it. Okay, right? yeah. What she's saying is it turns out that that's probably not the best way to do it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. So so NMN is uh, nicotinamide um, mononucleotide. Mm -hmm. And there's a bunch of these precursors, right? The, uh, we're trying to find the right molecule that will then support NAD. It's very much like glutathione. We're like, oh, glutathione's our big antioxidant. Um, you know, that's part of our big antioxidant system. Well, let's just supplement glutathione. It turns out that's not a good idea. Mm. We want to give things like uh, N-acetylcysteine and glycine together um, to act as precursors. So your body, it gives you your body the ability. Here's all the 
the material. Like I'm going to build a deck. Mm -hmm. I can't build a deck without the material. And this is just giving us the material. So we're not just like importing decks. Uh We're importing the material to build. And so the same thing with NAD, trying to replete those intracellular stores in the mitochondria, we thought, oh, let's do NAD, IV, and all that. And she's saying some of the recent research is saying that's probably not the best way to do it. Because there ends up being negative so results or just it's ineffective well like everything else in the body there's a balance right Mm -hmm. and so we want to make sure because the more you put in there if it actually makes it where it needs to go which is intracellular most of it doesn't when they've done the what they call radio labeling studies do you know what that is you know i used to but i forgot radio (laughs) labeling is so we put um a, a, a low radioactive substance uh, you Typically, know, like a hydrogen, a hydrogen, you know, like tritium or something like okay. that, where it tags the molecule. So, in other words, one of the hydrogens is a tritium or something that is has a little low radioactive radioactivity to it, and so then we can trace that molecule where it goes through the body. Hmm. By that, it's a way to kind of determine that. And so, what she's saying is, what what we've shown is these NADs that have been tagged. Um, they're not ending up intracellular inside the cell that we hoped it would. Yeah. Stuff sounds fake. Like it sounds so intense. <laughs> like you're attaching stuff to little Dude, things. And let me tell you, there's all kinds of crazy. It's a lot of fun. That's crazy. It's a lot of fun. There's something this called is the research side that you guys really like, right? Well, like, yeah. Well, we yeah. that's where we met in a biochem research lab. Yeah. So there's something called luciferase that that, <laughs> that you can tag on something that actually will glow as a tag. There's all kinds of stuff that we use in molecular biology techniques to actually look at where things are going. If you took a lot of it, would you become the devil? He did. (laughs) That's the case, isn't it? Okay. See, there we go. Mm -hmm. Okay. It explains everything. (laughs) At least a little bit, that's for sure. So uh, So, those are just molecular biology techniques. Anyway. So uh, mitochondrial optimization, Perhaps people are going about it the wrong way. Mm. Um, There's better ways to do it, and that's something that we need to think about. And and one of the last things as far as foundational things really is uh, back to sleep and cortisol management, stress management, right? Mm. So cortisol is not for muscle building, right? It's for glucose storage, uh, and too much of it can uh, impede repair overall. And and it's a... It's typically, it can be a catabolic hormone too in some ways where cortisol will release glucose from the... Tears things down. Oh, okay. As opposed to anabolic. Mm -hmm. So it will release glucose from the liver. It's one of the things it does because it's a stress hormone. Mm -hmm. Think of it that way. Mm -hmm. Stress hormone, it's like, okay, we need to feed the brain and then we need to conserve our resources. Mm -hmm. That's what cortisol does. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so it's not going to allow for appropriate... um, tissue recovery, tissue building, et cetera. So, Got it. you know, if you're working out seven times a week mm-hmm. and, you know, hitting it hard and you're not going to build here. muscle, right? Mm-hmm. And you you may, were looking at him, weren't you, You may too? take longer times to, to recover. So uh, from, from injuries that should be pretty quick. Mm. That's the overtraining thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which becomes a cortisol issue. But, I mean, other stresses too, right? Mm-hmm. So if you're so... Stressed about stressed out about having to drive to work every day, sure, and or work itself, or all of the other things that comes with I don't know being an adult, right? And just compounds the yeah. So mm. sounds like allostatic load, which we've had a whole episode about. <laughs> yes, you about did. That. Yes, you did. <laughs> so uh, we're just going to talk about some very specific peptides today for mm. actual muscle building, muscle recovery. Um, there's a particular group, the growth hormone releasing hormones and growth hormone releasing peptides. We're going to talk about one pair in particular, and that's CJC1295 uh, uh, with ipamorelin. Who is making this name? I don't know. Okay. Molecular biologists typically yeah. will make the most ridiculous names ever. So they make that name mm-hmm. that you just said mm-hmm. with numbers and letters. Yep. Mm-hmm. And then is it like a supplement company takes that and then gives it like semi-glutide as the name that people know? Uh, like they'll yeah they'll eventually make it into a medication and call it something something like androgel yeah or whatever yeah. okay um 
and we're going to talk about a mitochondrial peptide, mm -hmm. uh, MADA-C. We're going to talk about something that's actually not a peptide. It's called um, MK677. Mm. Um, and we're also going to talk about um, mechano uh, growth factor. So, Before you get going on those, can mm -hmm. you tell what is a peptide? Yep. So peptides are pieces of proteins that have some sort of biological activity. Okay. So a great example that everybody knows about is insulin. Whether you're a diabetic or not, you have insulin. Um, you make it. Diabetics, type 1s, have an absolute need for it because their immune systems attack their pancreas and they can no longer make it. Um, type 2 diabetics who continue to um, not take care of themselves and not um, use up their glucose like they should, pancreas will continue to push out insulin to try to take care of all of that it will eventually burn out the pancreas that way, or at least those cells making insulin. And so then they need it too. But that's the very first peptide that was ever discovered well, mm. and then made into a medication. What's interesting is we can tell if someone, there's something called factitious disorder where someone's trying to make themselves sick for attention. Um, you may all heard, but people like Munchausen's and those type of disorders where they'll inject insulin in into their body and you can tell by doing it's a c-peptide right mm -hmm. where you can tell the difference um in blood work between actual insulin produced mm. mm -hmm. and actual injected because of the cleavage the, a, a specific peptide that's formed yeah. mm. so remember proteins so you have amino acids building blocks uh, uh, amino acids are single entities those are hooked together to make peptides when a peptide gets a certain length, you start calling it a protein. Proteins have primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structures, basically how they fold, okay? okay? But when you break a protein down to its bare minimum, it first is broken down into peptides, and then those can be broken down to individual amino acids, if that helps everyone. Okay, no, yeah, it does. Okay. So um, the first class, those growth hormone-releasing hormones, growth hormone-releasing peptides, um, other people know some of them, the tesamorelin, semorelin, uh, um, but the CJC1295 uh, with ipamorelin, and this is without that added uh, diacyl group. So most of us in the peptide field don't actually prescribe that, uh, but I guess it's available commercially in research grade, which I would advise people just don't get those peptides. I get it. It's cheaper. But what are people using this for? They're using it for, um, uh, they're using it for sleep. They're using it for longevity. Mm. They're okay. using it for a lot of things. But it's not prescribed. It's not pharmaceutical grade. Right. Mm. So there's a there's a difference between research and pharmaceutical. But I know there's plenty of people out there that are buying it. And unfortunately, I think that. I saw a peptide group where they were talking about using one of those companies to source their peptides, and it's not a good practice. Okay. Um, and so peptides are also something that's compounded. Um, they're not FDA approved, so let's just put that out there. Uh, there is a pharmaceutical group that is looking at the BPC-157. Forgot to mention that. We will be talking about that also. Um, but uh, to make that into a medication, which means price is going to skyrocket, unless, of course, you know someone that's compounding it. Um, but it's, um, but we want to make sure we're getting good sources of these. So the, the CJC1295, one, uh, or um, one, two, nine, five, I'm just going to call it CJC with ipamorelin. <clears throat> the benefits of that include um, increased muscle mass and strength. So we're not just getting larger, we're getting stronger also. Uh, decreasing body fat, so leaning people out, um, also can help with um, sleep. So we're hitting a number of factors here that help with growth and recovery. Um, also helps with memory and cognition, not part of being stronger, mm. uh, but is good. Helps with increasing bone density. Um, also increases skin elast elasticity and helps with overall muscle recovery. So that's a really great one to do. 
one of the things that we need to be careful about with these growth hormone releasing hormones and releasing peptides is that it's going through a pathway where it's stimulating something called insulin-like growth factor one. And when we're doing that, if we do too much of it, uh, we can start having what's called involution of the receptors or our outies are becoming innies. Um, and sometimes that can be irreversible. Like our belly button? Like our belly button. Like it, it will turn to an Audi? It'll, it, so we'll have involution. It'll go in, it'll, instead of being on the outside of the cell, it'll go inside. Oh, not literally our belly button. Not literally <laughs> our belly button. But like belly buttons are innies oh, or outies. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, Got it. I was imagining someone's Audi turning into an Audi. So, <coughs> yes, and so that's. But it's ooh, doing that. I at got the, all excited. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Bill. Okay, it's doing that at the cellular level, not actual our actual belly button. Not our actual belly button. Got yeah, it. the receptors. Now, okay. If you become <laughs> big mm -hmm. and not in a healthy way, mm -hmm. your innie can become an Audi. Is that true? Oh. As if like you get really fat. Yeah. Is that why a lot of the like uh, steroid gut guys, they always have Audis, and it's like weird looking. Is that because it's pushing? Probably. Okay. Some visceral fat. Yeah, it ain't good. It's I don't not know. good. Good not sidebar good. there. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so we we cycle those off and on. So we'll do it for like three months, and then we'll take a month off, and then bring it back on. Mm. And it's more out of uh, an abundance of caution because some of the original studies were done with just straight growth hormone, and there were some cancer developments with that because it also will increase that IGF-1 uh, and will have the involution of those receptors. Mm. And then, um, so they put, they, they associated that with the peptides. And that's not been proven yet, but like I said, out of an abundance of caution, we mm -hmm. recommend that people cycle them. Do them for 12 weeks, take four weeks off, then do them again for another 12 weeks. One of the things that's kind of a theme that they're talking about, there's a, tr um, in like evolutionary biology circles is, you know, there's a trade-off um, between building and growth and then risk of uncontrolled growth, mm. which is cancer, mm -hmm. okay. right? So if you have a big growth, if you're making the environment very, very advantageous for growth and you're hitting that really, really hard all of the time, if there is a predisposition, it's not necessarily just causative, but if there is something maybe smoldering there, like a, a little, you know, neoplastic, which is cancer, mm -hmm. it could make the environment favorable for that. Yeah. Okay. If that makes sense. So yeah. there's always a trade off there. Right. Yeah. But they've only really seen that in straight growth hormone. Right. And that's because most people take it at such high doses. Um, so growth hormone is something that's released pulsatile throughout the day. It's people that are taking HGH or like the, for cosmetic reasons, whether it's bodybuilding or Oh, they're taking it for longevity also. But and, the people that are blasting it. Oh, yeah. They're the ones that are like overdosing it mostly. Mm -hmm. like yeah. That, and know. so then you could get to a point where you're making some uh, irreversible changes in those cells that's not going to go down a healthy pathway. Um, our next one is uh, BPC-157, mm -hmm. one of my favorite compounds ever. Mm. So it's pro it's, I think it's the first peptide that I even prescribed. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it's Body Protective Compound 157. They actually isolated it outside, or, or they isolated it from the normal juices that are in our stomach, so the gastric juices. Um, and what they found is that um, people that have, like, chronic heartburn, um, those uh, other ulcers, they're actually lacking some of that. Mm. So as an oral form, it can be great for things such as um, uh, helping with gut healing. So... Um, something that I'm going to be trying uh, with a couple of my patients that have some heartburn that I'm not able to, to treat with other factors. So we're going to add this in for them and see if that will help. Um, but they also, there's hundreds of research articles where they're looking at it for um, tissue recovery. It's extremely popular. I hear this, whether it's Rogan or... Yep. Oh, yeah. I just hear it all yep. the time. BPC-157. Yep. Like, and I know we've... 
Yeah, I've had you've it injected for, it. Yeah, yeah for your toe. Chris did it. We did that for his um, adductor tear. Adductor tear, mm-hmm. which was pretty horrible, and he got back on the mats much quicker than yeah. we expected. The exosomes um, probably helped too. The exosomes <laughs> helped also, but you, your more frequent dosing was with the BPC. Yeah, exactly. Um, and there's plenty of research out on the BPC one five seven and shows how it can help not only with tissue repair. Um, one of our friends, the one who actually uh, asked the question about muscle building, muscle recovery, mm-hmm. had a biceps tear, I believe. Yeah, um, from a bicep slicer. Yeah. yeah. And so that's what we injected him with to help oh, him recover also. I see. Uh, but it's more than just for recovery. Um, it also... Um, really? So it's not just a, re- uh, a tissue repair no, and stuff like that? No, it'll... it'll um, and Sorry, so I had to put my glasses on because I wanted to make sure that I got all of the, the research that's been done on it. So um, it helps with cell survival under stress. Um, it enhances that growth hormone receptor expression on the muscles themselves. Mm. So that growth hormone being something to help build muscle up and muscle strength. Um, particularly in the tendons themselves, so which is why we can get some tissue healing. Um, Something else that I thought was really important for um, those in martial arts in general, they're now also looking at it for traumatic brain injury. So one of our our training partners um, does some mixed martial arts um, uh, competitions, and that's going to be part of his post-competition how, how are you administering that is it oral or? so that one's going to be oral for okay. him for um for injury specific that would be an injectable okay the and brain stuff is going to be oral brain stuff's yeah. going to be okay. oral unless you can somehow find a way to do a nasal spray but i don't think they've done that yet mm. molecule may be too big i was thinking of like remember in Jurassic park they got that needle that goes t- into the it's not syrup. It's like uh, amber in the sap. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then it gets to the, the mm-hmm. mosquito. Mm-hmm. I was thinking if that was a brain. <laughs> we could go through your eye if you wanted. Ooh. Oh, because you can't. You don't want the skull. Yeah. We can put a little hole in there for you if you want. Mm. Isn't that how they used to do lobotomies? Mm-hmm. Through the eye? No. Nose. Oh, it's nose? Yeah. Oh. Oh, my. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I made that one up. <laughs> I, I, thought, I thought they just drilled a hole on the side of the head and went so in there. Much but that's yeah. what I used to think. That's yeah. trepanning. Yeah. Yeah, but that's oh, it's lobotomies. A yeah, that's. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, and then they also, um, doing a lot of mouse studies, they. I, I was telling Chris today when I was just making sure I had all my notes together, I'm like, it's really horrible what we do to, to animals in research studies. Um, but so. For the TBI, they were crushing. They were having things fall on these little mice heads okay. and giving them injuries and looking like concussion times. And they were recovering much quicker when they had the BPC before the injury. Jeez. And given after the injury. So This is like the Fauci beagle thing. Like It's like you don't even want to think about this stuff. Exactly, exactly. Um, and then also for crush injuries of muscles. So if we think about just our day to day, so back to the to the bicep slicer, or the mm-hmm. calf slicer, if we get a, a significant injury, having some BPC, I think personally, I think having something oral, daily oral, is good to have. And then if we have an injury, um, injecting that area very specifically will be helpful. Okay, so you're saying taking it in oral form just as a regular supplement is actually quite beneficial yeah, but you can't find the supplement much anymore because the fda is trying to make a drug or some pharmaceutical company oh they got to make that money yeah it's mm-hmm. trying to make a, a drug out of it so is it prescription based right now bpc 157 i do have a source that's still a reputable source that's uh doing a supplement still uh-huh. um but uh when it's in combination with other things it's prescribed so how would one go about obtaining uh, in a legal fashion right now? If they were a patient of mine, it'll be at the clinic within the next couple of weeks. Okay. If, so even if they're not a patient, if they're here in the greater Seattle area and want to drive up to Stanwood, sure. you can buy it. What if 
because we got a lot of listeners outside of the state. Yeah. With someone that doesn't, um, they can't, unfortunately. So, uh, Nutrineat is the supplement company where I'm going to be po- purchasing this from. I think you might be able to, as just a consumer, consumer get it. But I'm okay. not sure. Without a doctor note. Yeah, without a doctor note. But at some point, it's probably going to be. It's not going to be available. Yeah. And it'll be prescription only. I don't understand why. Why is that happening? Because somebody wants to make a. Yep. A oh. pharmaceutical company wants to make a drug out of it. So, so they can patent it and make so money. So they're taking it off the market as so a supplement. Hugely beneficial drug. Mm-hmm. They want to get that money. Well, you know how. But why do, why do they have to take it off the market to make a. Because so people can't get it. But I thought when you take like something, you have to add something like change it in some way. So for it to be patented. Oh, oh silly. Oh, silly, silly. I, I'm sure they'll do a little something they'll, to do it. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, you know how good the the FDA is really looking out for us all right now, so. (laughs) That's really stupid. Um, Yeah. And it's also good for overall nerve repair also. By the way, just so you guys listening, they tried to take N-acetylcysteine off the market. NAC. NAC. Yeah. The FDA did until there was such a public outcry, they, you can buy it again. What, What are some cases that's happened? Where there's actually been enough enough public outcry. That's to, one of them. Is there any others that you can think of on top of your head that? Not that I'm aware of. It's pretty rare. Well, it's 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 a corrupt organization that gets seventy percent of their funding from the people they're supposed to be regulating. Right. Well, and, I mean, right. I'm right. just as just a little side, and then we'll go back to the peptides here in just a second. So, Oregon State, I believe, uh, one of the universities out of Oregon, uh, actually just put out a little article that was saying how. The FDA is requiring fewer uh, uh, clinical trials to be done in order for drugs to be approved. Yeah. Oh my fewer. Gosh. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. How is that safe? I mean, or you could do none and just put it out to the <laughs> yeah. public and just call uh, it good. Let us. Yeah. And well, if the drug there company, were nine mice that were studied. Yeah. <laughs> if the drug company does more than one, does more than two studies, they only have to. Send two of them to the FDA. Yeah, in other words, there could be a hundred studies, mm-hmm. and they the only two have to good send ones. Are the two go that look real nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm yeah. I'm full on cynical it's now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, back <laughs> anyway. to peptides. Um, the next one is a mitochondrial peptide. It's called MOT SC, and that stands for. Um, oh, let me put these on because I didn't didn't know that it actually had a mitochondrial open reading frame. Uh, 12 srna c or they just call it modest c um, it's a mitochondrial peptide it reduces muscle wasting so muscle atrophy um, it's an exercise mimetic so it simulates muscle growth mm. um, if you're going to use it um, for training um, so here are our friend that wants to get a bigger chest mm-hmm. he would want to inject that uh, into the pectoral muscles mm. before and after training. Okay. Yep. Um, definitely after, but ideally before and after. So if you're looking very specifically <coughs> to target something, that's a way to do it. Um, it's also used to um, regulate genes related to metabolism and protein stasis, mm-hmm. um, muscle metabolism, so how that's using up its nutrients, myoblast adapt adaptation to metabolic stress so how are those muscle cells responding to exercise um and when you give it late in life um it helps those older frail people um become more physically active and increases their health span Mm. so instead of just talking about living longer living healthier um it's uh it's something that we do make naturally during exercise. Mm. But again, if we think about um, if this is coming from the muscles and we go start going through sarcopenia when we're in our 40s, then we have less of those cells available to use. So putting that, um, putting that back in uh, may not necessarily be a bad idea. It's the same kind of idea of TRT in a way. Mm-hmm. You know, we're, we're kind of replacing what you've lost a little bit and helping muscle function more optimally to stimulus such as working out. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, and that exercise, they actually, there was a, a fairly new uh, exercise that modesty really only comes from, is increased during endurance exercises and not resistant exercises. Which makes sense because it's a mitochondrial thing. Typically, one of the primary adaptations, and this isn't just black and white. I mean, there's crossover between, but one of the most, one of the big adaptations to endurance exercise is what's called mitochondrial biogenesis, where we actually make more mitochondria mm. into the muscle, allowing for more aerobic capacity in that muscle. It makes sense, too. Yeah. Yeah. It also will increase our own local NAD pool, so back to talking about NAD, mm. um, and also helps with exercise performance. And, and we'll talk about these peptides um, and exercise performance uh, I'll put a little caveat here at the end because we do want to be careful when WADA is involved. Oh. The World Association for anti doping. If you're doing some World sort of professional association, yeah. So yeah. there's a yeah. number of peptides that are on the list that are on the list to include the CJC epimorelin, tesamorelin, sermorelin, mm. like anything that they think is going to cause a boost. They're they're. Uh, Making it illegal, and they'll test. They're testing you. For yeah, it. USADA would be all over it if you okay. are in that testing pool yeah. for some reason. Okay. Yep. Um, two more peptides. Or if we yes. can s stay on the modesty. Yeah. How do you get it? Prescription based. Prescription. Uh, over the counter. All, okay. all of these should be prescription. Okay. The only one that right now kind of available over the counter or as a supplement is the BPC one five seven. Okay. Unless, of course, you're going through that research mm. peptide uh, where a lot of people are. And, again, I would not advise that. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so your doctor would have to request? They would have to get these from a compounding pharmacy mm -hmm. that's doing peptides. And there's only a handful of those that's doing it well. In so, the one, you States. need to have a doctor that's willing to do that. Mm -hmm. like that as understands in, that, it. That understands, like, the mm -hmm. compounding and then... Two, they'd have to get, like, obviously have the connection with uh, one of the quality compound pharmacies mm -hmm. as well. Okay. Yep. yep. Um, the mechanical growth factor, or um, PEG MGF. Mm. So PEG means they put a polyethylene glycol attachment to it uh, to help increase its half life. Because if we just gave mechanical growth factor by itself, it would only last maybe 10 minutes. When we add the um, polyethylene glycol to it, it lasts for 24 to 48 hours. Mm. So it sticks mm. around much longer. Um, mm. It helps with bone repair and uh, bone growth. It also helps with soft tissue repair. Um, it also helps with um, muscle inflammation. Uh, and it also works through those growth hormone receptor areas also. Let me ask you something, mm -hmm. so especially since you train under Dr. Seeds, who by training is an orthopedic surgeon. Mm -hmm. Why aren't they using this stuff intraoperatively, like this one particularly? So let's say I'm doing a meniscus repair, right? And then while I'm in there, why not shoot some of this stuff in there? Because they're not FDA approved. Plenty of people do stuff off label. I mean, I know orthopedists are, you know, off PRP. Off label, but off label uses. Oh, for of, FDA approved. Right. So it's a, still a medication. It's coming from a pharmacy. So now, there's a number of orthopedists. There's a whole variety of providers that are training under Doctor Seeds. Right. Or one of the other peptide groups. Um, uh, the. The reason that I bring up Dr. Seeds is he really goes through the cellular mechanisms for why this is important and not just here's a protocol. Mm. Um, and just personally, I like that better. A lot of people seem to like that better because then it gives you a little better understanding of what's ongoing. Um, but there's a number like um, Dr. Seeds has them as soon as they're out of surgery like, okay, here's what we're doing, right? I see. So uh, he's retired now um, and is just doing more training and um, clinical work and not necessarily in the operating room. But there's a number of orthopedists that are part of the group, and they talk about it all the time. Yeah. yeah. So to me, that would seem like, you know. Yeah. You know, especially you look at 
I mean, what are the risk profiles on these things? They're very low. That's what I'm... Because... Yeah. What did we just say they are? They're peptides. These are yeah. peptides. Yeah. These are something that we're making naturally within our own body that they've then made into a medication like they have insulin. Mm. So... Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. So we have very little risk. The risk comes from the injection. Any injection, you get a little burning, you get a little itching, you get a little bruising. It's an injection, right? There's a few of them, like back to the growth hormones, and then this uh, MK677, that we have to make sure that we're not just hitting that system month after month after Mm -hmm. month, like we're cycling it off and on. So uh, the last one is the MK677. Um, It's actually not a peptide, but it's still used within the peptide community. Um, This book, uh, Dr. Lavelle put it in there, um, where he uh, has it listed as part of protocols also. Um, What's this book? So this is uh, the peptide handbook. It's it's designed for clinicians, but it is uh, very reader friendly. So anybody mm-hmm. could pick it up and read it and see. But everything in here, like if you look at all of their protocols, they actually put all those foundational pieces: adequate hydration, adequate oh, okay. nutrition, good sleep. Like, they're putting all those pieces in there because we can't do these things in isolation. They're not silver bullets. They're not. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as much as people want them to be, Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're only going to get so far by only addressing one aspect of health. Yeah, we've had conversations with people, you know, that we know recently, especially that they're hoping for these silver bullets to fix certain little issues. Yeah. Whether that's mood swings or yeah. weight loss or a, a maybe some sort of ailment or something, and they're just a lot of the time they they think that there's just one thing that they can yeah. do. Well, right, and when you and when you're addressing those foundational things, then things like this are optimization, right? Mm-hmm. Where now we can make just the whole system work better, yeah. mm. especially in an aging person, yeah. right? Right. Um, so MK six seven seven, it actually. Uh, binds to the androgen receptor, so where your testosterone would bind. Mm. And so that helps with muscle growth, muscle repair, um, helps with strength, help, helps with recovery, um, increases lean body mass, increases bone density. Um, and it's, a, again, oh, it also will stimulate growth hormone. So it's a growth hormone secretagogue. Um, and so that's why you can only use it for 12 weeks. You have to, you can cycle it on and cycle it off. Okay. That's a generally a, probably a good practice with a lot of supplementation though. Don't you think? And uh, nutrition supplementation, I think cycling through things. Yeah. Um, very few people, you know, when, when patients ask me about nutrition, unless we're like working on a goal, uh, for like weight loss or something like that where I have them do like a carnivore or ketogenic or something like that diet. Um, I, we talked about just general nutrition as being like, you know, do paleo for a quarter, then do Mediterranean, go to keto, do carnivore, cycle those through. See um, what works better for you too. And maybe you have one that's like, oh, that's really caused me a lot of bloating or whatever. Mm-hmm. But then mixing it up is always yeah. a good thing. Is that the yeah. same with, uh, you, would you say the same with, like, I take the cordyceps and uh, the, a lot of the mushroom stuff in my I, coffee in the mornings? I think like, switching those around. Mm-hmm. Okay. Perfect example, like, idea. sometimes people use, like, ashwagandha or something like that, yeah, like, I at night. Nightly, yeah. Sometimes stopping that and then switching to, like, phosphatidylserine or another mm-hmm. a, kind of an adaptogen type of thing is always a good thing. That, so. that, yeah. Does it has a similar effect, but it's yeah. different. Okay. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So that's all I got, guys. <laughs> yeah, well, let, let me ask you then. Um, that time is over. That time's over. Yeah. <laughs> These things, you. a lot of them, the way you're describing them, it seems like we could have a synergistic thing. I oh, mean, yeah. how would you, if someone really wants to optimize, I guess it depends on your situation. Let me give you two scenarios. One, um, just let's just use my injury. Mm-hmm. Um, like I had a adductor tear, mm-hmm. you know, my groin muscle, pretty bad one. Um, what, if you had someone like that with like a muscle tear from mm-hmm. jujitsu or something, what would you, what would be a pretty good kind of protocol and what would you consider using? 
uh, assuming that other portions in yeah. their life are good, like we have good nutrition, good sleep, yep. stress is managed. Um, the BPC, the exosomes to really initiate healing mm. or something along those lines. Which whether, we talked about back in the regenerative medicine right. podcast. Um, and then uh, the BPC, I think, is a good way to go. Now, for you, yeah. so Chris is often a, a guinea pig for me for trying things, <laughs> right? Um, and That's where that third nipple came from. It, Don't be a hater. He was born with that. Oh, okay, yeah. my bad. Um, so uh, we tried the Mod SC on you. Um, he didn't know what he was getting. I just gave him some shots. Good. Yeah. Which, yeah, I don't want a yeah. placebo thing. And then yeah. you're able to milk them later. <laughs> you got nipples? You're, you see her trying to hold back I right do. now? I do. She's <laughs> really trying to behave right now. Um, you're setting her up. Yeah. So, uh, so anyway, so he was starting to notice some changes in his game overall. Um, but what, do, what do you mean? Like feeling stronger in some positions okay, where okay. he's just like, I'm not recovering well. So I, I love my husband. Mm -hmm. He's a little bitch. He, he, when, you know, he's like, I'm just not recovering well. <laughs> we have a little, I love that impersonation. We, 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 we pretty extra. We throw a little fit about it and, you know, he's you know, missing his heyday. So I'm like, all right, well, we'll just try this. And, yeah. and I'm like, come here. I was injecting him for a while, and I haven't heard that complaint now for a while. No. No. So Actually, I, I heard the opposite. I, I think I heard you were telling me you've been feeling really... I've been feeling good. Quite good. Yeah. 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 I think dialing uh, I think you're in... You're down a little bit, right? On I'm like at 178. I think the carnivore with fruit is really agreeing with me. Mm. Yeah. yeah. But um, the for an injury like that, I would just keep it super simple. Okay. Because right? peptides, they're just expensive. For sure. Right. So uh, we have to be careful about it. Well, then who would be like kind of your person that would really benefit the most? Is it, you know, let's say you're over 40 grappler maybe mm -hmm. would see the most as opposed to someone in their 20s. It, it depends on what we're doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. For you know sure. what I mean? For sure. Yeah. But now if that 20 year old has an injury, well, of course we're going to treat well, the injury. Of course. Injury, right? But as far as the. But for overall performance, making sure those foundational pieces are in place um, to include hormone optimization. Like, I just can't really say that enough. And I know, you know, people are like, well, I, my testosterone was just fine. It's in the normal range. Really? How are you feeling? Mm -hmm. Right? Um, and so keeping that optimal and then, okay, what else, what else are we missing? What's lacking? Where do we need to perhaps cycle these in? Let's say that I feel like my aerobic capacity, I'm, I'm doing the inputs like I'm doing the quote unquote zone two cardio. I'm, I'm trying to do the things to keep, and I'm rolling just to try to keep my endurance up on the mats. And I feel like I'm falling off. I'm getting winded with like the mitochondrial. The mitochondrial be, and then the growth hormone yeah. pair. Yeah. Yeah. So you could kind of, depending on what, what they're, how they're feeling and what they're trying to do is how you would kind of adjust those together. Exactly. Yeah. What about the middle age, th mid thirties to up and up, um, person that, that they, they're just looking for that little extra something for muscle growth they're, They don't need to be on TRT. Mm. Um, but they were hoping to ha just have some maybe extra supplements like one of these peptides or something. So if they were going to do a peptide for overall, uh, uh, growth, uh, yeah. muscle growth. Like they I train would, a lot, so they, the recovery thing is going to be important. But I'd, they're, I'd yeah. cycle them with the modesty for a little bit. Mm. What about the MK? What was that one? MK that, six seven seven. That wasn't a pet pet. That it's an androgen binder, though. Yeah, Th that's a good one too. That's so a good one. They're <clears> both <throat> exercise mimetics. So but you'd start with the modesty. The I think I would. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When just for everyone listening, exercise mimetic means it's something that mimics the effects of actual exercise, yeah. very much like a sauna does. But they, once again, it's not just taking that's not going to make. No, no, fit. no. But it, <laughs> but it, but it has similar effects to that of the stimulus of exercise. Yeah. Exactly. And it can be completely just pissing away money if you're smoking, drinking, eating mm -hmm. like garbage. Yeah. Yep. Totally. <laughs> not saying shift work will completely kill you, but I mean, yeah. If it, you're not optimizing sleep. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. 
how <laughs> short, how long do um, the effects of these peptides last in somebody before they start noticing like a decline of things like not? Do you know what I'm saying? Like if you're using it like the CJC for muscle growth, sleep, things like that, right? Mm-hmm. But once you stop taking it, how long before you now resume back to your previous? Like maybe you'll maintain the muscle, but do you know what I'm saying? You're not right, right. So if they're cycling it, how long? Yeah. So they should really they should cycle it, right? So you know, uh, Doctor Seeds thinks like the growth hormones need need to be done maybe three times a year, right? So two to three times a year to mm-hmm. just help with longevity for like a and, couple months at a time. Yeah. 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 So. Um, so this is something people would want to continually be on for like the rest of their lives sort of potentially thing? well okay. yeah well i mean it, it's not dependent on them but if you want to optimize what you're doing i yeah, guess okay. and it depends yeah. on you know okay yeah i was just wondering because i didn't know if it was something where you take it for a while you get the benefits and then you kind of can keep those benefits for a while and then maybe things start to like go back down or if you have to just continue so like anything else right okay. so let, let's go back to one of the exercise memetics right if when they stop that, if they don't put the input in there to mm-hmm. maintain it, you're going to go back to where you were. How quickly? That depends upon what the rest of those lifestyle factors are like, right? Mm-hmm. So if your sleep and nutrition are shitty, it's going to tank pretty quickly. Okay. But if you're doing all of the other things that you should be doing to optimize your health, mm-hmm. it, it'll go back gradually, but it shouldn't be... It shouldn't be before you cycle it back on. Well, okay. and, and you mentioned the expense of these things and actually then finding someone. Mm-hmm. So it might be a good time to talk about resources and yeah. you know, what so, are we looking at for these things? Yeah. So um, uh, Dr. Seed's group, the, the SSRP, um, they don't have a website to find doctors. That really is more for doctor training. So mm-hmm. any of the clinicians out there that are listening... Um, check out the SSRP Institute um, if you're interested in uh, learning more. Um, there is the peptidesociety.org. That's the International Peptide Society, but their website is peptidesociety.org. Um, they have a list of providers. Um, the Clinical Peptide Society also has a list of providers that are doing this. Uh, that's who Dr. Lavelle is, is a, portion, a part of. Um, and then another really good group that does peptide training, um, Dr. Seeds was affiliated with them at one time, is A4M. Um, and that is uh, the letter A, the number four, the letter M, mm-hmm. dot com. Um, and under there, find a doctor. Most of them have some sort of peptide training. Mm. Would be the three websites that I would go to as a patient to find someone in your area. Mm, to Okay, that would fall under those things we talked about earlier. Of yep. They understand it. They understand the compounding piece. Mm-hmm. They'll uh, kind of administer yep. appropriately. Yep. What about the, so 40 years old I am, mm-hmm. I have made a decision that I think uh, I, instead of trying to be as light as possible um, for just health and longevity sake, I'm, I hope to potentially if it takes a year, maybe a year and a half, I don't know, is to make my walk around weight. Right now I'm uh, like 75, 78, like right in there, uh, to be about 190. But I, I want it to be a healthy, like m- just more muscle. I just want to build muscle so for as I start atrophying in time, now that I hit 40, that I have a better starting point getting on something like that I, I have to start lifting weights obviously yeah and that's the, a big part <laughs> yeah the, 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 the i think we're both on the same thing the volume of jujitsu that you do that isn't that's not muscle Con- building conducive to the goal yeah I, i'll have to sub out y- yeah something yep yeah. and by the way um i can just tell you your cardio will suffer a bit mm. just so you know i just got told that I have really good cardio and it made me feel so good. Well, my point is though, every time I creep up north towards 190 mm-hmm. and I can get to 190 yeah. I, pretty quickly, um, <clears throat> that muscle mass has to be fed with blood. Mm-hmm. And you will notice there's a 
there's a balancing and I've tried to my optimum with maintaining good muscle mass, adequate strength, <clears throat> but also maintaining a good amount of endurance and cardio yeah. for me is around 180, 178 to 180. When I start creeping up north, um, I get really strong, but I start gassing real quick. And that's mm. just that's just the nature of it. So that there's a trade-off, right? So do you think Okay, I understand that. Cuz my my I guess my larger fear uh-huh. is that as I start to get older yeah. that I be, obviously I don't really lift much, so that I will yeah, like start lift. to <laughs> I will start to atrophy. I will start to lose muscle mass like rapidly and then i'll be that weak 57 year old that like can barely hold his groceries what you'll need to do is do something like what i'm doing now okay and you'll need to cut down your training volume Mm -hmm. uh, and then add uh, some dedicated strength training to that and it doesn't have to be a lot right like a day or two yeah got it and i'm i'm doing pretty well at 53 right now Mm -hmm. to maintain what i have right now um with you know um TRT, of course, and, right. and um, eating really, I mean, we really try to. So I don't necessarily have to like put on 15, 10, 15 pounds Matter of fact, muscle. No. <clears throat> okay. no, you should probably just maintain where you are now. And what I would argue is just be okay with maybe going to um, staying where you're at and then just competing at medium heavy. So you're not cutting because, mm-hmm. yeah, it's 181.5 for IBJJF is the top limit for middle. Yeah. Uh, I meant, did I say medium yep. heavy, middle heavy, whatever, you know, the next weight class up. Yeah. But instead of then having to cut down so you can wear the gi and mm-hmm. still maintain that, you can just stay where you're at. I Don't walk, worry about cutting. Yeah. Walk around and you'll still be in that weight class. Walk and, around at 181. Perfect. And it, then with the gi, I'm 185. It, and, yeah, exactly. And that's, yeah. I think that's a much better way than you're not having, because what's getting you for the competition piece <clears throat> is the actual the cutting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> for the gi. Now, if you could weigh in without a gi, right. that'd be a completely different story, right? Right. Or weigh in the day before, uh, you know. So, more so, someone in my situation, mm. it'd be drop a training day, or at least, like, the two-a-days. The, don't do You're that. You're opening up a big can of worms with me, my friend. Yeah. Like, you I did two open mats today. <clears throat> Weird. <laughs> so, you're... Yeah, so like I'm at th- I have three training sessions a week, three jujitsu, jujitsu, just a week, uh-huh. and that's that with a strength training session, twice a week. Nope, once a week. Once a week. And then what I am adding in is some walking. That's why I have that motor that yeah, um, yeah. the treadmill we're getting. That's yeah. uh you know the air assault, the air runner. Yeah, you, it doesn't help you walk. You. Per- it, but I'm going to stay yeah. in that low level just to get a little. That's not a big hit to the system. Mm-hmm. But give you that kind of that. Yeah, I hate to use and it. We, we zone go for two. Yeah, fairly long walks, or, or which is great. A couple times, a but week. that's about all I can handle. Okay, because otherwise I start getting catabolic. That overtraining state is a catabolic state. Your body is like, hey, dude, you're okay. Yeah, and so it's a hard pill to swallow because that's what I've struck. I've told you I've, how much I've complained about this. Yeah, yeah, for as long as I've been doing the podcast and before. Right. I had a big fall off in athleticism and recovery at 45, big. Mm. And that's when I noticed it the most. I was still doing really well, even into my early 40s. Were you about the same size, too? Yeah, but I... You were closer to 170. 170 when I was doing a lot of mountain biking Mm -hmm. and stuff and doing real hard trail running. Some some Mm -hmm. muscle. Uh, But in medical school, when I was, you know, in in my early 30s, um, I was almost 190 pounds because mm-hmm. I was just lifting most of the time, right? right? And so I will cycle up to that, but I don't feel good that way. Mm. Um, so I think it's a happy medium. So if I were you, mm-hmm. in knowing your build, mm-hmm. I would just, um, you know, if you do want to gain a little bit of muscle mass and strength, you can't serve two masters, mm-hmm. right? You can't yeah. do six days a week of training, and some of those are two days, mm-hmm. which at 40 you're going to start, you're going to do it until you can't, which right. will happen fairly quickly. Right. And then you, what I would say, as much as you'll hate me for saying this, I'd say probably about four times a week mm-hmm. and then have those other two when you're really feeling like, oh, I got to go do an open mat somewhere, get a lifting session in. Gotcha. Yep. 
and I think you're you'll be stronger, your recovery will be better, mm-hmm. and um, I think your jujitsu will be better. I mean, it's already very good, mm-hmm. but as far as your motor learning and all that stuff is just gonna be sharper because mm-hmm. you're you're not pushing that red line all the time. I see. If that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I mean, a lot of people do. I notice. think Olivia's taking notes right now. She's like, yeah. she's like, <laughs> oh, it's recorded. Ammunition, <laughs> son. She's very excited about all this. She's like, we can watch Jersey Shore at night. Oh my goodness. Oh my. Okay. I called her out right there. Look, I jujitsu is addicting. Yeah, it absolutely is. Just a fascinating thing i just am totally full into it and that's mm-hmm. why i've had such a hard time and curious at throwing fits and stuff yeah. like that because i've been so angry at my body my perception of my body um betraying me basically yeah. like oh i can't recover i can't do all those sessions i used to i used to work out what you know how i used to work out i mean crazy like yeah. six days a week mm-hmm. at least you know we'd go on these four hour mountain bike rides and these twice in a weekend you know what i mean i mean so yeah yeah. so but just for those everyone listening you know when it's okay but i think pulling back a little bit will actually make things better yeah and get you to your goals a lot of people do notice when they take a a week off they come back perfect example the cardio is down a touch but like their timing is actually quite good they feel fresh and they feel sharp yeah explosive that's the nervous system being recovered and so that's kind of what i'm getting at Mm -hmm. and and honestly i'm still walking the line at three times a week with the other stuff i'm doing yeah Um, so you know it's in these little optimization things is where people can you know where this can help those of us in that situation so yeah. anyway i know we've dragged this on for well a while. that kills me on the inside it's i know okay. you're in denial i'm in a lot you're of gonna denial. be in denial until you can't do it anymore and you'll still be in denial but but i'm, I'm not well, I'm, he's in denial so why good. completely <laughs> that's what i'm saying i i i'm in good company yeah uh, yeah i've been a little baby about it yeah. and so for a long time and so now i'm like all right well yeah <laughs> well if you guys got any questions for Dr. Kerry Hardy or Dr. Chris Hardy, please email them in grappling with podcast at Gmail or make a comment on the YouTube page. We see those all the time too. Mm-hmm. We will respond mm-hmm. on there or um, we will just literally talk about it on the next episode. And thank you, Kerry, for making the time to come yeah. in. She's super busy and I just really appreciate it. Yeah. She always comes in prepared. So Absolutely. So other than that, thanks y'all. Yep. See you in the next one. See you.